Well, welcome everyone for um, the next series in the uh, Coffee Science Seminar. Um, today, um, just introducing myself first, is, uh, I'm Kieran McCosker within the Coffee Group in the Centre of Animal Science. Um, those of you who um, I'm looking a bit unfamiliar, that's probably because um, I only joined Coffee in October and still um, getting to meet a lot of the other people in the group. But I look forward to doing that in the f near future. But um, acknowledgement of country first is that I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands in which we meet today. I pay, res pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Now, um, this seminar is scheduled um, to happen now and hopefully it'll run for um, about an hour um, and, and essentially we'll be running through a presentation by Melissa on, on the work that she's been progressing in Northern Australia and um, afterwards there'll be opportunity for people to make um, comments, questions and, and um, seek answers to those questions from Melissa's. Um, we request that you do this using the Q&A button uh, function within the Zoom at the bottom of your, um, the window browser of, it, of, of Zoom. And um, that allows us to sort of track those questions and, um, and can feed that back to uh, Melissa or others um, down the track. Um, just to introduce Melissa, um, who hasn't shown up yet again, but hopefully she's not too far away. Um, Melissa is currently working in the Northern Territory Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade, and um, but she's uh, talking to us today about her PhD, which she's doing um, with the University, um, with Coffee and the University of Queensland, um, with the supervisors, Alan Tilbrook and Jeff Fordyce and others. Um, but Melissa is based in the Northern Territory at the moment, um, at the Victoria River Research Station. Uh, some of you probably won't know where that is, but it's, um, a, it's approximately halfway between Catherine in Northern MT and uh, Kununurra in the northeast of uh, Western Australia. So it's quite a remote location. Um, in 2011, Melissa completed a Bachelor of Applied Science, um, majoring in plant and animal biosecurity with UQ. And, um, before being a stock inspector in North Queensland for about six years. So, as I'm sure he said, I'm Melissa Woodison. So I am based at Victoria River Research Station in the Northern Territory. So, uh, hence my internet issues at the moment. But for my PhD, I've been looking at the effects of analgesia and hemostasis on beef calves during dehorning in Northern Australia. So I wasn't sure how familiar everyone would be with dehorning. So I thought I'd just give a quick overview of what that process is. So cattle are naturally horned. Um, that was for defense and competition. But in an agricultural setting, we remove those horns and that's for the safety of the people handling the animals as well as for the animals themselves because they can do serious damage to each other when they have large pointy horns. So the majority of the northern herd uh, is currently naturally horned. So it's comprised mostly of Bos indicus or Bos indicus cross animals, which are naturally horned animals. Uh, while there is pole genetics starting to come through, it's a complex sort of genetic condition. It takes a fair bit to breed in. So genetic change doesn't happen overnight. So dehorning will continue for the foreseeable future. Um, but we want, as an industry, we want to improve this practice, basically. So horns, um, cattle aren't born with big horns, obviously, they have to grow. So they develop from a specialised group of cells called the which you can see in this photo of this little guy. Uh, it's initially... free floating which means it's not attached to the skull underneath when they're first born be highly variable so it starts to grow out into that divide into that and what we mean by that is in the photo at the top right you can see all those air pockets and whatnot inside the horn itself sinus has extended so what we have to do when we 
don't want horns to grow, those horn growing cells. So the two diagrams here show the two stages of it. If we get it when it's still free floating, as in the picture on the left, it's just a case of removing that little bit of skin because the bone hasn't extended into it. Whereas once the bone starts to extend, you know, to remove that growing skin, you also have to remove some bone and tissue underneath. So as I'm sure you can understand, that's a, it's a pretty major procedure for these animals. So there's different techniques we use for this. So when they're small, you use what's called a disbudding knife. Uh, as they get bigger, you would upgrade to scoop or cup dehorners. Uh, the other option that people have is hot iron dehorners or cautery dehorning. So that's using either a hot iron that's come out of a fire or an plugged into electricity to heat it up and it burns that horn growing tissue away and stops the horn from growing. There is also caustic paste, um, which is a paste that's put on there that eats away at the tissue, but it's not really used in Australia at all. So what is the problem? So why are we looking at it? Uh, we know dehorning causes significant discomfort to these animals, as I'm sure you can imagine, especially once that bone has extended. So there has been a lot of studies done on dehorning, but it's mostly been done in Bostaurus type calves, which are generally younger than what's dealt with in the north of Australia. So they tend to be sort of four to six weeks of age. And the observations that have followed have generally been short term. So eight hours, 24 hours and whatnot. So as I mentioned in Australia, we have primarily Boss Indicus cattle. And at the time of dehorning, which is usually their first muster, they could be anywhere from three months to 10 months of age. So at a 10 month old animal, we're dealing with something that's quite a bit bigger. And the difference between them and the studies that have been done is our animals are often unhandled as well. So this is the first time they've seen people, first time in the yard, it's a very stressful situation for them. So we started to identify the knowledge gaps, um, how much blood do cattle actually lose when they're dehorned? How effective is the pain relief that's currently available when we applied it in these situations up here with our older animals that are probably a bit more stressed just in being handled in the first place. Another thing we noticed was we didn't know, there was no reference as to what infection rates were observed following dehorning. So we've created a wound, we put these animals back out in the paddock. How many get infected? Um, is there a mortality rate? Do animals die from this? How long does the pain last for? And how long does it take for these wounds to heal? So in the Northern environment, they're often dehorned, put back out in the paddock. And if we see them again in six months time, that's the next time we'll see them. So as I've said, my, my study is really looking at the northern environment and trying to apply it in the way it would be applied up here in a commercial sort of situation. So the first thing I did was look at meloxicam, which is a product that's currently available to producers. So we wanted to use products that commercial producers could actually purchase. Uh, so we did this in the form of the meloxicam injectable. We had 85 heifers, so we didn't have any um, contradictions with castrating or anything going on at the same time. Um, they were split into five treatment groups. So there was some pole animals, so they weren't dehorned, obviously. And then there was animals that were dehorned with and without pain relief. And we also had a very small group of surgical dehorn animals where we gave them a full ketamine stun and dehorned them while they were under the sort of sedation. And we surgically put some gauze over and sewed that over the wounds to try and create a wound cover. Um, so that was sort of our like best case scenario for these animals. Uh, so what we did then was we monitored the behaviours very intensely for the next 67 days. So for the first week, it was four times a day paddock observations. And then for the next two weeks, it went twice a day paddock observations. And then it went to once a week. And at the final inspection, they were brought into the yards and they were weighed. So they were weighed at the beginning and weighed at the end to try and see if there was a production difference as well as a welfare sort of difference. And obviously the big challenge with trying to assess welfare of animals is they can't tell us how much something hurts. So we have to try and use other measures to understand, are they feeling in pain or are they feeling comfortable? So we're not looking for just pain behaviors. We're also looking for normal behaviors. Um, so as you can see, the list of things we were looking for is your pain behaviors. So head shaking, ear flicking, um, head pressing, but we're also looking for normal behaviors such as grazing and ruminating and drinking water. Um, we also collected tail hair for cortisol analysis. So Hair cortisol is a fairly recent sort of technology. It's been more extensively studied in people, uh, but has recently sort of been applied to some livestock sort of situations to see if it would work the same way. 
it does appear to. So we will we'll go over the results of that. Um, and it is worth also noting that these calves were also ear tagged, earmarked, branded and vaccinated at the same time as dehorning, which is very, very common again for the northern industry. Um, so the general observations of what we noticed with the pain related behaviours was that they showed them more in late morning and afternoon rather than first thing in the morning. Um, some behaviours we didn't really see in the paddock observations. So these observations were made with binoculars and a telephoto lens on a camera, so from a great distance so that we didn't influence their behaviour. Um, ale shaking could be seen to peak in the days following and it lasted for several weeks. So that was rather surprising that they were still showing these pain behaviours several weeks later, given that we know cattle as a prey species try to avoid showing pain behaviours because they don't want to be eaten by the predators. So the fact they're still showing these behaviours indicates that there is still quite a significant level of discomfort there. And there wasn't a difference between the animals that were dehorned with pain relief and those that were dehorned without pain relief. But there was a difference between animals that were dehorned compared to the sham dehorned animals, which were not showing these pain related behaviours or were in very, very low levels. And we did get six cases of infection in the animals, which was determined as a purulent wound exudate, so a clearly visible infection. Um, again, because we had to be able to see it, we had these animals in a paddock, as would be their normal situation. So that was a 13% infection rate. And that was um, two from the meloxicam dehorn group, two from the control dehorn group, and two from the surgical dehorn group. So, as an example of the behaviour tail shaking, so we can see um, the morning and afternoon observations that it was present yeah, for about two weeks after the procedures, they were still showing pain related behaviours. So we can assume that the pain associated with dehorning is more chronic than previously believed. Uh, so the provision of meloxicam says it works for about 24 to 36 hours. So this is sort of demonstrating that the pain lasts longer than that method of pain relief would be providing cover for. So we did also monitor the animal's weight to see if there was a difference in performance. Um, so from these graphs, you can see that the sham dehorned animal, which as you can imagine, stands to reason if the animals are in pain, they will not be performing as well. Um, we did notice the infection in animals with infections performed even worse again. So we separated them out into their own group just for this analysis. So we did them included in the treatment groups and taken out to include them in their own. And it can be seen the infected animal performed sort of the worst of all of them. Uh, we looked at wound healing. So wound healing time hasn't really been documented for dehorning wounds, like exactly how long it takes. Uh, so we graded it on a five point scale. If anyone wants more detail on what the scale was, I can provide it later, but essentially one is fully healed and five is the raw open wound. Uh, so there was no significant difference between the treatment groups, uh, but there was a significant difference between animals that were dehorned with the dehorning knife, so would have had smaller horns versus animals that were dehorned with the scoop, so had larger horns. So smaller horns, a smaller wound, it, it heals much quicker. And the tail hair cortisol. So as I mentioned, we did tail hairs. So at the time of dehorning, we shaved a section of their tail. So we knew exactly how much tail hair had grown in the 67 days following. It was approximately three centimetres. So that was then halved into two lots, which represented days zero to 33 and days 33 to 67. So sort of the month immediately following and then the second month after. Uh, what was interesting could be seen that all animals experienced a drop in cortisol. So the special thing about tail hair cortisol is that unlike blood cortisol, which peaks really quickly and drops away, to get cortisol to fix into tail hair, it has to be a prolonged stress event. So the cortisol has to be elevated for quite a period of time. So the reason we went for this over blood cortisol for these animals was, as I mentioned, they're unhandled animals. So just getting them into a yard to take a blood sample they would have had extremely elevated cortisol levels just from that handling, regardless of being dehorned or not. So the tail hair cortisol, we're looking for, you know, are they in a prolonged stress event? And interestingly, they all were, and they all experienced a drop. And I think 
I believe that may be associated to the fact that these animals were weaned at the same time. So they were taken off their mothers at the same time, which may be what's causing this elevated stress event. Uh, the surgical dehorn group, for some reason, didn't really experience any kind of drop, but there was only five animals in that group. So it, its relevance is, is a bit more, a bit harder to apply to the other groups, which had 20 animals each. So that was the first study. Um, the second study I looked at was how to reduce bleeding. So as we know, animals that are dehorned are usually dehorned and just let back out in the paddock. So there's basically no wound care done at all. And we know these wounds can bleed quite a lot. Um, there has been cases reported of animals going into shock from blood loss and dying from that. So what we wanted to look at was how could we find a way to reduce bleeding in a way that was practical and applicable to a commercial situation. So it had to be something that was easy to use, um, legally available to everyone, and something that could be put out into the paddock basically, because again, the animals probably aren't coming back. So it's not something we can put on take off sort of thing. So what we developed was some cotton patches. So they're round cotton patches. Um, you can see this animal here, he's got one on, they've got two little sticky tabs on them. And the idea is that these patches being 100% cotton, um, you apply them to the wound straight after dehorning. So you apply pressure to the wound, which is wound care 101, apply pressure to stop the bleeding. These patches, the blood soaks in and it sort of creates an instant scab and cover over the wound. And then when these animals go back out in the paddock, these patches will stay on for a period of time, drop off in the paddock and because they're made of cotton, they will just naturally disintegrate into the paddock. So we had the plain cotton patches, but we also thought, how can we make them better again? So could we introduce something like a hemostatic agent that promotes blood clotting? So we did a bit of research and we discovered kaolin. And kaolin is a naturally occurring clay. So again, we wanted something natural that would be okay out in the environment. And it activates factor 12 of the clotting cascade. So that's how it works. So when it comes into contact with blood, activates factor 12 and just helps blood clot a lot quicker. So we found a way that we could impregnate that into these 100% cotton patches. So we had some plain patches, some kaolin patches, and we also thought, what if we added in some trisulfan as well? So as we mentioned previously, you know, there's some, there's some products out there available to people. Trisulfan is one of them. It's a topical analgesic. So got some pain killing properties. It's also got some antiseptic properties. So that was sprayed onto the wound and then a flame patch put over top of it. So as I said, this picture here is an example of a little guy out in the paddock with his little patch on. And you can see the little bit of blood that did come past the patch. Um, so we assessed blood loss. So how do we know how much blood they lose? The answer is we don't really. It's really, really hard to try and capture in a field situation. Um, so what we did was we assessed blood loss visually based on the amount of blood that had passed down the face. So whether it had passed the eye line, the jaw line, onto the dewlap, uh, past the dewlap, or was quite extensive across the face. So level five was it passed level, but there was also ex like extensive bleeding sort of, it had spread quite a distance. Um, and this is what we got as a result. So blood loss score. So each side of the animal, the near side and the far side got a score. So there's 40 scores per group, essentially. Um, and there was statistical difference between the control group, which got no patch and the Kalen group and the plain patch group. And there was a trend for it for the trisulfan group to be lower as well. So that one wasn't significant, but it was, it was a trend. So it does indicate that providing a patch of any kind actually does reduce bleeding and that the kaolin patches were the most effective. So with that blood clotting agent, uh, that was the only group that got a score one on any animal, uh, which was very, very little bleeding. So how well did the patches stay on? So these animals were monitored for a month in the paddock. They were checked every single day for the first 14 days to see how the patches stayed on. So, Basically, it was looked at whether they still had both patches or only one patch left or they'd lost all their patches. So we can see by one week later, there's still a significant number of patches attached for all of the three treatment groups. It didn't seem one patch stuck better, any better or any worse than the other patch. 
uh, by about day 14, most of the patches had come off. But it did indicate that these patches did stay on, which we were unsure if they would come off five minutes after these animals were let out of the yard. So the retention was actually better than we were expecting. So wound healing. So when these animals came back in at the end of a month, we, we had a look at their wounds to see how they healed. Again, we looked at the left and the right side. So each wound got a score. Um, and when we looked at the proportion of animals that had a score three wound, um, the control animals that didn't have a patch had proportionally more score threes than the other groups. So this also this indicated that providing patches did improve wound healing. So yeah, as you can see, the ones that had patches had proportionally more score two versus score three, whereas the control animals had higher level of score three wounds still. Uh, so that was the end of our blood loss study. Uh, we have another study going at the moment and it's being run by the Northern Territory government with funding from MLA. And it also includes WA and Queensland departments of agriculture. And it's looking at pain relief applied on commercial properties across Northern Australia. Uh, it started with a pilot study in the Northern Territory, which involved 448 calves at two research stations in the Northern Territory, uh, monitoring essentially change in weight after dehorning and castration. So this was a mixed group of animals. So some were dehorned only, some were castrated only, some were castrated and dehorned. Again, that's very representative of the commercial situation in the North. Um, and what we can see is that castrated and dehorned animals do lose more weight than pole animals, which was sort of reflected what we saw in that first experiment. Um, and did take those animals a fair while to catch up back up to those pole animals. Again, we monitored wound healing in this experiment. Um, so days 79 and 56 at the two different sites, they were still at a score two. So that indicates that the wound has shrunk in size, but is not fully healed. So day 79, that's over two months later, these wounds still have a way to go to heal. So I think it just emphasizes the prolonged healing time that these wounds actually have. Uh, wound infections, so this was looking at, again, castration and dehorning wounds. Dehorning wounds had a higher rate of infection than castration wounds. Um, it does look like there's differences between treatment groups there, which is animals that did or did not receive pain relief, uh, but none of those differences were statistically significant there. So the products we used were meloxicam and trisulfan because they are the only two products that are commercially available to producers to use at the moment. So um, this was then rolled out across NT WA. We're still waiting on the Queensland data. So there was 1,876 animals across the different sites in Northern Territory and WA. Um, as you can see, the results in average daily gain were very variable from site to site. Some sites animals gained a lot of weight, some sites animals lost a lot of weight, um, which probably illustrates the importance of nutrition in the time following castration and dehorning. Um, but again, those sites that did have pole heifers, the pole heifers performed better than animals that were castrated or dehorned. Uh, wound infection, so we still monitored that. It was monitored on day 21. So as we know from previous experiments, most infections are visible on about day seven to nine and most usually resolve naturally without any interference within a few days. So infections that are still visible on day 21 21 are fairly chronic infections. So uh, we would expect there was more animals and now there is a few, fewer. So what we're seeing at day 21 is the more chronic infections, which were still sort of ranging from 0% up to 12% of animals, which is higher than I think a lot of producers were expecting to see in their animals, which was quite eye-opening for people. So we know infection has an increase like weight loss associated with it. So we know improving infection rates, so reducing them, we could improve production from addressing that issue. Um, it is worth mentioning that all of these properties use what, as close to aseptic technique as we can in the field. So all equipment was put into disinfectant between each animal's yards were watered down to try and reduce dust. Animals were let out of the yards sort of as soon as they could be after an observation period to get out of the dirt sort of thing back into the grassy paddocks 
So these are infections where we were taking measures to try and reduce infection. So in this group, we also tried to monitor behaviours in the paddock. Again, it's really hard in the extensive northern environment to monitor animals because they're in very, very large paddocks. Um, so we put some GPS collars on some of these animals. So five animals from each treatment group. So control group, no pain relief, meloxicam group, meloxicam and trisulfan and the trisulfan group. Um, so this is a map of just one animal's movement for 21 days. So he had pretty good paddock utilization. Um, this is a photo of an animal with his little GPS collar on and an accelerometer ear tag, which I'll talk about shortly. So what did we find from the GPS data? So we've got this data from all of the properties and we started looking at it. So how do we look at it? Well, the first thing we looked at was how far are they actually walking in a 24 hour period in each day and does that change? So we see they have a bit of a peak in the second day, um, consistent across all treatment groups. They all had that peak before they sort of all started to settle down between eight to 10 kilometers that they were walking a day. So it was interesting to see that that's the distance they were walking but there wasn't really any consistent difference between the treatment groups. Uh, so we also look at the time they spent stationary. So we took that down to minutes per hour. So how many minutes per hour was that animal stationary for? Um, again, there was no significant difference that was consistent across treatment groups. There were sporadic differences, but it, it wasn't following a pattern that the control animals were was consistent across all treatment groups, what we were seeing. Uh, so we also looked at the minutes per hour they spent within 100 metres of water. Um, so if anyone knows cattle and cattle behaviour, they know cattle like to camp up. Um, so they generally do this at a water point. So we assess how long did they spend camped up at water points. Interestingly, when these animals were first put in the paddock, they spent the first three days sort of walking around the paddock higgledy piggledy, no real pattern to their movements. Um, again, no real difference between the treatment groups. But after that, they then settled into this really defined grazing pattern, which you can see in the graph of where they're out grazing, they come back to water, they stay camped at water, they go out grazing, and then they come back to water. So it's interesting to see that there's obviously a fair bit of disruption going on in the first few days, which is when the sort of the discomfort, the pain would be at its peak. Uh, so whether that was the association there, that they were all in discomfort, so they're all moving sort of erratically. Um, it, it's an interesting observation to make and hopefully it'll be confirmed by looking at the results from the other sites as well. So we also put some GoPro cameras in the yards. So we were looking at the behaviours they were expressing that we could see in the yards in the 90 minutes following dehorning. Um, so we looked at, again, the same sort of pain behaviours that we were looking at in the earlier study, head shaking, tail flicking, ear flicking, foot stamping. Um, the only behaviour we'd noticed a difference in was in the foot stamping, in which the control group expressed this behaviour and none of the treatment groups did. So we saw head shaking, tail flicking, ear flicking in all of the treatment groups um, and the proportion of animals expressing those behaviours was not different between control animals and between animals that receive some form of pain relief. So accelerometer tags, which we saw earlier um, on that little fellow who had his little yellow ear tag. Uh, so they are tags that are recording movement 24 seven. So this is an example of the graph that we get. So the idea is it's a really, really intense monitor of the animal's behavior out in the paddock. So this is the graph we get. Unfortunately, we're still working on the algorithms to recognize behaviors at the moment to apply to this data. But what we're hoping to look at is time spent ruminating, time spent grazing, and picking up um, the really obvious, really strong behaviors such as head shaking and ear flicking, and seeing if there is a difference between treatment groups, again, animals that did or did not receive pain relief uh, so these accelerometers, where we're pretty excited about them. Um, we're just sort of working out the algorithms at the moment, which takes a bit of time. But once we get that, that'll be a, a really, really intense behavioral monitor. Um, so that's sort of what where we're at at the moment. Uh, we had a few challenges to face, and that was, again, just 
the challenges of how do you monitor welfare, how do you measure it, how can you measure it in an extensive environment where you don't have access to these animals 24 seven and they're not handled animals so you can't get close to them. So we've been yeah, trying to use a combination of new technologies, behavioral observations, uh, welfare indicators through performance and uh, the innovative technology of tail hair cortisol, which was quite interesting to see the results there. But that's pretty much the end of my talk. Thank you. I'm pretty sure there'll be some questions. Uh, I think Kieran takes back over now. Yes, thanks, Melissa. A, a uh, good compilation of work there. Thank you. Um, and so now we just uh, keep on going with um, providing people with the opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, people can do that using the Q&A function at the bottom of their Zoom window. Um, and then I can read them out. Um, just remember that the chat, um, we prefer it if you don't use the chat uh, function because the Q&A actually captures the question for us later on. Um, just to start you off, Melissa, I was wondering if you could give us a, everyone a bit of an overview of where you think industry is at, at the moment and how widely adopted and accepted um, the use of these products are and, and um, you know, the thinking behind using them. Yeah. So over the last few years, the adoption in industry has become more significant. Uh, so it did these products products have been available for a little while but it has taken a while for adoption to extend into the northern industry and the big hold up there for a lot of people is time and cost essentially so the time to apply these products and the cost associated with them because if you have a thousand weaners to do even if it costs you two dollars a weaner then that's you know it's it's an extra two thousand dollars sort of, of expense um, some of these products do have an expense to them, but we are seeing more and more adoption take place. So quite a lot of properties now are using them, especially trisulfan, just because it is sort of the more cost effective of the two options. Um, but yeah, there is, there is quite a bit of adoption starting to take place out in the industry at the moment, but there's also a lot of hesitancy to uptake these products as well. And from a, a, society point of view and and um and from the industry do you think that they require an actual production gain for them to use these products or do you think um you know this adoption is going to happen anyway naturally just because people want to provide the best welfare and outcome for animals yep so i think at the moment there's definitely a group of like producers out there who would like to see some kind of production benefit to warrant the cost of these products but as public pressure grows we want to improve these we all want the best for our calves i think adoption will become sort of standard practice for everyone at every site and as more products come on the market i think we'll definitely see more and more adoption and it may become sort of a, a marketing advantage to producers they can advertise that all of their beef was produced with the best welfare practices we can um, yeah, so just uh, one of the questions that came in was, do you think that um, any of these procedures will ever become mandatory, like, you know, the, um, become mandatory to provide pain relief for some of these procedures in the future? Um, what's your thoughts there on on that? I think, it's some, I think it's something that could happen. So around the world, in other countries, it is actually during dehorning some countries even go so far that it must be done by a vet it can't be done by anyone else so it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility that it could be introduced that you must provide pain relief during these practices but and, not yet but i believe it would be and so you know there's other methods to sort of address this problem um do you have any thoughts on the sort of the genetic applications associated with dealing with that so you know breeding for boldness or but what's what's the solution for yeah. say um castration do you think yeah well in terms of dehorning yes the, the obvious solution is people go oh pole genetics unfortunately genetic change doesn't happen overnight there's only so many pole sires out there so there is obviously increasing uptake more and more people are getting pole genetics because if we don't have 
to dehorn, we don't want to. So that in the long term, that's probably where dehorning will go. Uh, castration is a little bit more complex. It really depends on what market you're targeting and how old your animals have to be. If you're selling fairly young animals into a market that doesn't require steers, then maybe castration is something you should look at that you don't even need to do anymore. Whereas producing older steers, it's possible that castration will probably continue for quite a while. I, I haven't really looked too much into it as compared to dehorning. Um, and we've had about three or different, three or four different questions relating to the uh, statistical procedures and your plans there or things like that. Do you want to just comment on um, like where, where you are at the moment with that and, and um, you know, what, what do you, what's the plans for the future to, you know, assess whether they are real out, um, outcomes that you, or differences that you've observed or things like that. So. Um, so the, the people have uh, just... In the most recent study, the NTWA study? Um, well, they just noticed the difference. So you've got an unbalanced design in experiment one, um, just differences in numbers and in groups and things like that. So um, do you, have you applied stats to yeah. all your results that you presented today? And, and um, I suppose, you know, how long do people have to wait before you'll um, have some final outcomes for these? these? Uh, the studies yeah. that you've done. Yeah, so in study one, it, it was an unbalanced design in that uh, the four treatment groups, the two sham and the two regular dehorn groups did have 20 animals per treatment group, so they were the same. But we're also interested in looking at what is like the best case we could do in the north, which was like the full ketamine stun surgically, like closing the wound as much as possible. But it was sort of just an interesting comparison group. So that, that's why it only had five animals because it's not something that could really be commercially applied. It was just sort of uh, interest, positive control. Will we notice a big difference in these five animals compared to the others or not? Um, there really wasn't a difference in those five animals. So statistically monitoring them against the other groups, uh, some, some stats they were left out of because there was only five animals. So it, it changed the weight and made it difficult to see a difference. Um, so we were really just looking at a meloxicam during dehorning or not, and whether that had an effect on those animals. Yeah, so the surgical group was sort of just a an interesting positive control that wasn't included in all of the stats, but there has been stats done on them. Yes. And um, with the castration, did you or did you standardise the method of castration, or was there a difference between um, you know surgical castration and other you know rings use of rings? Um, so in the NTWA study, it was quite interesting because we were looking at applying it in commercial situations. So what people normally do. So for castration, there were some sites that use surgical castration, which is the full removal of the testes. There was one site that used ring castration, and there was one site that actually used crypt orchiding, which was to push the testes back up inside and then use a ring on the scrotal bag. So that drops away, but the testes remain retained. So it was actually good in that we got a couple of different sort of procedures out there. Um, most people did amputation dehorning. There was only one group that did um, cautery dehorning. So we did get a bit of a difference in procedures, uh, but we were really looking at the commercial application of these products. So if people are doing different things, we wanted to see how they worked in different situations. But the trends seem was sort of seen universally across all the properties and that's that there wasn't a difference in terms of production between animals that were dehorned and castrated with or without pain relief. We did break those treatment groups down into animals that were castrated only, dehorned only and castrated and dehorned because we wanted to see if there was an effect of the different procedures. Uh, animals that were dehorned or dehorned and castrated tend to perform worse, that was either gain less weight or lose more weight compared to animals that were castrated only. So that sort of indicates that dehorning is a bigger impact to the animal as compared to castration. And that was again seen on multiple sites. So it's that repeatability of the trends that we were seeing at each site. And, and taking that a little bit further is from your tail quarter sole um, results you've got 
um, just the process of weaning is um, a, a stressor in itself. Did you have any um, outcomes or observations from d applying these procedures and then putting the calves back on with their dams? And what, what benefit or what difference do you think that would have had? Uh, so none of these properties that we did did the morning and castrating as calves. They did them all as weaners. So for these animals, they were having, yes, a significant stress event just by the fact that they were being weaned at the same time. It would be interesting to compare these results to animals that were done younger and returned to mums. Um, and the big influence there could be we're just taking out the weaning stress and going on to mum, they're going on to better nutrition with still being on milk. Because um, we know that nutrition does have an influence in how these animals are performing. As we saw, some sites lost weight, other sites gained weight. So the sites where they provided additional feed or they went into really good paddocks, the animals tended to gain weight, whereas the sites that were um, going through a bit of a bad season and the nutrition wasn't quite as good were the sites where the animals lost weight. So I think we've got time for two more questions that I'll you know, go full out here, full on here. But um, one of the ones questions that came in was, you know, mortality rate is obviously an important production outcome. Um, and the studies or the, the, the results you presented today are only kind of a few animals to sort of quantify that, that sort of effect. So do you have any other plans to do work to address or monitor those um, difference in mortality rates? So for mortality, um, in the first experiment we had, my first experiment we did, we had no mortalities, so it was zero. Uh, in the NT pilot study, because the animals were monitored very, very closely, we saw them every few days. Uh, we had a mortality at each site. So that was one at KRS and one at Douglas, which gave us a combined mortality of 0.5 of the percent. Um, both of those animals that had a mortality were both castrated and dehorned. Unfortunately, we were unable to do postmortems because by the time they were found in the paddock, it was just progressed too far to do a postmortem to confirm what had caused that mortality. Um, but in the paddock, the big study where animals were out in the big paddock, it was very hard to confirm mortalities just because they were in a very, very large extensive environment. Um, some animals didn't come back for their second inspection, but that could just be because they were missed in the muster. They were still out in the big paddock. So we couldn't confirm them as mortality. We had to have an actual confirmed carcass. Um, but from the two studies I managed to find, which did reference mortality. So it's been very, very poorly documented mortality from castration and dehorning. I managed to find two studies that referenced the mortality rate from dehorning. One referenced 2%, one referenced up to 4%. So we know there is a mortality associated with it. Again, it's poorly documented, but unfortunately, because it's such a low percent, we would need extremely large numbers of weaners to get a detectable difference in mortality. Even a 1% difference, we'd need treatment groups of over a thousand animals each. Thank you, Jake. And um, I mean, other other work, like you've highlighted the um, importance of um, yeah, like your yeah, infection um, and the patches and things like that. Have you got further work planned to progress those findings? Maybe even yeah, addressing so some of that mortality issue. Yep. So the infection rate is definitely something that was concerning and surprising for, for quite a lot of us. I didn't think people thought it would be as high as it was. So addressing that would be important. Um, so with the patches, we currently have the kaolin impregnated. I would be interested to see if we could also put maybe a bit of a antiseptic or antibiotic powder into them as well to help reduce infection. And the idea is that covering that wound in the first place um, would stop contamination from getting in. Uh, so whether that as well would also reduce infection, um, would be probably have to do a larger study with these patches just to get more animals to try and quantify that infection rate and see if providing patches not only reduced bleeding but also reduced infection. And and you've got enough results now within this study to probably quantify the production impact of infection in the, within each of these treatment groups. Do you think that you'd be able yes. to say how much infection is actually causing a production loss? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, um, uh, I haven't. Actually that's great. Thank you. To Thank say you. infection costs you a kilo a day, but yeah, I, I definitely can do the stats from the data we have. Um, so just on behalf of everyone that um, was here today, there's been a number of people congratulating you on your presentation. So we thank you very much for taking your time out of your day to do that. And um, all the best to continue um, along your PhD path and, and progressing your studies there. Um, just the next, um, just to uh, promote our next science seminar, we've got uh, Wei Hu on the 22nd of March, who will be um, providing a presentation on identifying genetic factors responsible for the accumulation of Amyloic acid in um, macadamia kernels. And um, next slide, please. Um, uh, just a reminder that if people want to register for um, more information on the science seminars or um, get more regular updates on, on when what's who's presenting and when um, here's some um, scans that you can QR scans that you can use so once again thanks everyone for joining us today um, and um, we'll call it quits there thank you